Most of us have at least heard of hoarders if we aren't one ourselves or if we don't know one in our personal life. It's one of the most fascinating disorders. That's why people have made reality TV shows about it. But what most people don't understand is the mental and emotional component behind this behavior. And what most people don't know is that all of us fall somewhere on the scale of hoarding. We just tend to do it in societally acceptable ways. To hoard something is to accumulate something in a way where it is hidden or guarded for preservation, such as for future use. When people hoard, they are concerned with acquiring and gathering whatever it is they wish to hoard. They are also concerned with not parting with, letting go of, or discarding whatever it is they gain. This means that people who hoard are concerned with the coming and the going of things they feel a need to accumulate and save. Let's be honest, all of us do this with something. Absolutely all of us fall somewhere on the spectrum of hoarding. So I want you to start off this episode by asking yourself a question. What in my life am I preoccupied with the acquisition of for the sake of preservation and also anxious about the letting go of? I'm going to give you an example. Unless you understand that keeping lots of money in the bank is in fact not very financially smart because it is making money for the bank, it's not making your money work for you. Most of us look at somebody who keeps a lot of money in the bank as financially intelligent, when in reality it's hoarding. Hoarding implies trauma. It implies trauma that caused a distress that we're currently trying to relieve through the behavior of hoarding. The trauma of the Great Depression, for example, gave rise to an entire generation who hoarded valuables, who hoarded money. At the most extreme side of the spectrum are people who we call compulsive hoarders. These are people who psychologists or doctors would diagnose as having compulsive hoarding disorder. It is my hope that unveiling the reality behind the most extreme hoarding behavior that you will not only understand it and everyone who falls short of it on the spectrum, but that you will relate to it in such a way that the way you relate to and or interact with hoarders will change. To understand hoarding, you have to begin at human nature and then fast forward to the beginnings of a person's individual life. All biological organisms in existence have needs. There are physical needs, things like food and water. You have emotional needs, like connection and security. You have mental needs, like the gathering of information. We could perceive ourselves to need anything that we think ensures our well-being, success, or happiness. Because that is what a need is. It's something that is required in order to live, succeed, or be happy. It is human nature to need a way to be able to meet those needs. And it is a need to be able to meet those needs in a way that does not lead to more pain or the loss of other needs. And this is where the trauma occurred with someone who is a compulsive hoarder. It is a potential that a traumatic loss or a series of losses can be the thing that catalyzes a person to exhibiting this behavior for the first time in their life. It's a compensation behavior. Essentially, these things in their life which cannot be transient or go away become like a safety signal in their life. And if any one of these safety signals goes away, it causes them to feel extremely vulnerable and it kicks up the original distress that was caused by that lost trauma. However, this is not the predominant cause of the behavior of people with extreme compulsive hoarding behavior. Often the experience of a loss simply triggers the onset of the behavior itself rather than being the original cause of the behavior. It is a trigger of the original wounding that is much, much deeper. Hoarders did not have their needs reliably met. Now, if you look in their childhoods, sometimes the reason they didn't have their needs reliably met was constant relocation. Sometimes it was the loss of somebody in their early life, so naturally they had less resources and so their needs weren't met. Or sometimes it's the byproduct purely of a fully dysfunctional home. The bottom line is their needs were not reliably met. These people are the byproduct of emotional neglect often extreme emotional neglect, if not, on top of it, physical neglect. To understand more about this, watch my video titled, Today's Great Epidemic, 
and how to solve it. The lack of love slash resource that they felt from other people gave rise to the belief that other people were only ever capable of focusing on and thinking about themselves. And if somebody is only capable of thinking about themselves, then they're only concerned with what use they have for them or how they're going to take from them. Because of this, they see people as inconsistent, unreliable, impermanent, and dangerous to attach to. People can't be kept. They feel there is no way to hold on to a person and to make it so a person doesn't take from them. Therefore, there is no way to control the person or predict the person in a way to be able to stay feeling good. They experience themselves as being only a tool or object in someone else's reality. Therefore, they suppress the part of themselves that wants a relationship with people in favor of relationships with objects. A lot of times, things were taken from them in their early life and not replaced. And this, this is the most important part. This led to times where they experienced trauma and extreme distress because they needed something that they did not have. This trauma around needing something in order to feel good and not having it was so bad. This is what they're trying to avoid at all costs. It has given rise to a permanent and very strong ownership boundary. A hoarder can look at literally anything and tell you some potential thing in the future that they could use that thing for. Because it is so traumatizing, the idea of being in that future scenario, any future scenario, and needing something and not having it. Because they grew up in experiences where it was not this free-flowing, giving, nourishing, resourcing type of experience, they do have an issue with abundance. They don't experience the inflow of abundance. They didn't feel that they were simply able to get things when they needed them. Many people who hoard experienced deprivation in childhood. This made it so that gifts or things became very special. However, Gifts or things that were special often came with a consequence. They experienced most of the giving in their lives happening towards them from other people to be actually a covert form of manipulation. In essence, they experienced people giving to them being a way that people got from them. So things were special, but gifts were a take instead of a give. Needing anything from anyone, therefore, became dangerous. It became a recipe for indebtedness. To understand this dynamic fully, watch my video titled Cut the Invisible Strings, How to Detach from Manipulation in Relationships. The lack of love they felt and the danger in needing things from people made it so that they detached from their idea of needing a human being and instead replaced that need onto physical objects. And this is where the perspective of a hoarder gets very different to the majority of people on the planet. To a hoarder, if they are able to use something in a way where it adds to their well-being, they perceive that as the object loving them back. To understand this, I want you to imagine that you fix your car with a wrench. Because you used the wrench to fix the car and fixing the car made you feel a sense of security, now imagine that you see the wrench itself as the thing which created that well-being for you, and therefore the wrench itself as loving you, and you perceive the wrench as giving that to you and not needing anything in return. So it's the closest that you can get to unconditional love. Now because you feel love from that object and you can keep the object, you can keep that love. The thing is, everything in existence could potentially add to your well-being in some way. I dare you to look around your house. I mean, it doesn't matter what you look at, any object that exists in your house, pick it up and think of a potential time that that could add to your well-being. Now you have one of the first reasons why a hoarder has a space that is full of so many things. Because it's impossible to come up with an object where there isn't some scenario where it could add to your well-being. This means if what you're after is the feeling of security that you will never face a day where your well-being could be dependent on something you do not have, everything is valuable and everything could be needed. This means that a hoarder experiences extreme distress at the thought of throwing something away. 
the acquisition of an object or some other thing that a person could hoard is part of the pattern of hoarding. It's why so often hoarding goes hand in hand with things like compulsive shopping or other forms of compulsive acquisition. Every object seems to be a venue to secure one's personal sense of security and to ensure somebody's well-being. That's why it gives you such a kick. Seeing the potential use in every object is actually a way of preventing future pain and guaranteeing future pleasure. That's a hell of an insurance policy. When the closest relationship and the safest relationship that we have is with objects instead of people, what we find is that the objects in our reality start to become much more personified. They take on a much more human nature. Now, I know that all of you can relate to this because most of us, if we're honest, especially in our childhood, had some sort of attachment object which we felt was alive, even though, according to scientific standards, it wasn't. Maybe it was some toy that you loved. Maybe it was a stuffed animal. And this is where the life for a hoarder becomes much, much more painful. If you grew up in a situation where you feel your needs are not met and everyone's just out for themselves and you're a thing for them to use, you don't feel valuable in and of yourself. You feel like something to be used and discarded. What this means is that you identify with and relate to trash. And this is the thing most people haven't figured out about hoarders. If you identify with trash, you can't just throw something away, can you? Because the second that something becomes trash, you identify with it, and therefore you can't throw it away without throwing yourself away. This means that for a hoarder to throw something that would qualify as trash away, not only are they solidifying that terror of ever being in a scenario in the future where they need something or want something for their well-being that they don't have, it's also setting themselves up to reinforce that original wound of their own lack of worth. Because a hoarder has this self-concept, this core self-concept of shame, and therefore identifies with trash, then when they do this behavior of seeing value in anything and everything, including those things that most people would label as trash, look at how they're trying to heal themselves. They're trying to solve the wound in an external way of being treated and seen as if they had no value and of being used and discarded. Doesn't it make sense then how this adds a second layer of why it would be terrifying for someone to get rid of or throw away something? For a hoarder to be able to let go of anything in their possession, they have to stop identifying with trash. They also need to resolve the trauma of feeling like no one saw their potential or value, the tragedy of which they are projecting on the things when they are concerned with not wasting something. Most hoarders also felt a sense of trauma around exposure. Now this is very common when we live in scenarios with people in our environment who don't really see us, feel us, understand us, or see our value, it kind of gets terrifying, doesn't it? I did a video a while back called How to Attune or Attunement. And in that, I gave a scenario of a little kid with a jellyfish. Now, because this child really isn't thinking about the experience of the jellyfish, he takes the jellyfish out of the water and obviously kills it in this way. If you grow up in circumstances like this, you actually need to protect yourself. You feel kind of like hiding from that person. And so when that person sees you or, or has the opportunity to interact with you, that exposure becomes life-threatening. Having clutter around actually is experienced as enclosure or padding from potential threat. This is especially true if the hoarder experienced people constantly taking from them in childhood. When this is the case, the hoarder doesn't want any of their things to be taken, obviously, Having in piles and piles, however, provides security that if someone takes from them, they have more. If they have nothing, the only thing for someone to take from is their own body or being. The closest that you're going to be able to get to this emotional state of being is to imagine that I put you down in a shark tank. Only I put you in a shark tank with eight foot walls of meat all around you. Now you hate it when the sharks attack you when they take bites out of that meat. But you also love that meat, don't you? Because what happens when they've bitten all the way through that meat? The only thing left to bite 
is you. Now let's go to one of the most fascinating aspects of hoarding behavior, and that's piles. The thing that really sets most extreme hoarders apart from everyone else is the fact that their house is nothing but piles. Why piles? Regardless of what a hoarder might say to your face, hoarders actually like piles. The reason is the following. A pile feels like a tangible savings account full of things that could ensure their well-being should they ever need that thing and therefore an insurance policy for their physical and emotional well-being. When they make a pile, they often forget about a lot of the things that are in that pile. And when they go through the pile again, they uncover those things which they forgot about. Every time they uncover that thing they forgot about, they get that same hit or that kick they got in the acquisition phase of that uh, article. It causes them to go, oh, oh, I could use that for this and basically feel that enhanced sense of security all over again. I know you know what this feels like. When you forget about something awesome in your fridge and you open your fridge and you go, oh, 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 I totally forgot about that. That's amazing. How good does that feel? But perhaps the most fascinating and must be understood aspect of why hoarders like piles is because it's their way of creating and controlling closeness. Now it's this next point that makes it so that I don't personally believe that a hoarder's issue is lacking the skill of organization. Hoarders identify with objects. Obviously, that's the thing that they had the safest relationship to. Now, when a person organizes objects, what they do is they separate those objects. They create distance between the objects. The way that that feels to a hoarder is the same as it would feel to you if today someone moved into your house and took every single one of your family members, moved them into separate apartments within the same building, and suddenly you are all living your own individual lives. Organization feels cold to them. It feels like isolation. It feels like separation emotionally. Basically, this process of organizing when they're identified with objects causes them to feel alone and in their separate segregated reality because they have externally identified with the object. To understand more about this, I want you to watch my video titled The Most Dangerous Parallel Reality. To a hoarder, a pile feels cozy. It feels as close as they can get to community. The space that is created through organization brings back the underlying feeling of emptiness that was created through emotional neglect. And there's another layer to this. You remember how a hoarder identifies with trash. If they can put something that is technically trash next to something that is technically valuable, they have just externally created a connection between themselves and whoever in their early childhood environment had the value. Basically, it's an external way of reuniting and controlling and establishing the closeness that they could not get in their childhood. Most hoarders don't like movement. This is because that trauma of loss makes it so that they don't really want to collect a hoard anything that could get away from them. Obviously that reinforces their wound in relationships, right? Even people who hoard animals, they don't identify with their animals wanting to get away from them. And while the rest of us can see that the animals they hoard are technically in captivity, that's not the way that they see it. But this is the reason why they don't want to hoard people. Because people can get away. And it actually reinforces the original trauma. The idea of keeping someone captive that doesn't want to be with them. That just reinforces this belief or this wounding that they have around being trash and about being unwanted. This sensation, however, is the sensation that is bulldozed by serial killers who hoard bodies. The serial killer who hoards in this way is often doing so specifically to prevent the coming and going of a person and to be able to be in control over the keeping of them. This behavioral strategy usually includes severe and repetitive perceived abandonment trauma. So you can see, what creates a hoarder is a specific storm of circumstances which all lead a person to this particular way of coping. Because of all of this wounding around needing, they cannot perceive themselves to not need something now or potentially in the future.
This means that hoarding is a scarcity issue, yes, but not in the way that most people think. It's not that having piles of things around makes them feel abundant. It's that having piles of things around makes them feel the safety of the insurance that there will not ever be a time when they experience the pain of needing and not having, or being left alone in emptiness, or being forced to need something from a person who will take something from them in return, or reinforcing the wound that they themselves are worthy of discarding. What most people don't recognize is that hoarding is in fact an addiction. Now let's define an addiction. An addiction is any substance or behavior, it could be anything really, that enables you to not feel the pain that you're trying to avoid. There's always a wound when it comes to addiction. And the addiction that we're looking at on the surface is the strategy of avoidance for going into and resolving that wound that a person doesn't feel capable of solving. Hoarding is no different. It is a behavioral addiction. Now, it is just as useless to go in and clean up a hoarder's environment, thinking that that's going to change the pattern of addiction, as it is to remove smoking from somebody and assume that that has resolved the underlying pain. And the thing is, when it comes to addictions, it does almost no good to focus on what the actual addiction is. No good to really focus on changing that until a certain point in healing. Why? Because if that wound still exists unresolved, then there will always be a motive for the addiction. And the addiction will just turn into something else. It is extreme re-traumatization to walk into a hoarder's environment and to throw away things and try to organize things for them. We are doing nothing when we do this than actually reopening this wound. Think about it. When we clean their house, we're putting them in a position to need something and not have it and not be able to get it in a way where they can stay safe. We're putting them in a position to feel that emptiness of the emotional neglect they suffered. We are getting rid of the relationships they do have and we are reinforcing the belief that they are worthy of being discarded. Obviously, no one wants to be living in trash, especially when the sanitation level becomes dangerous. It's perfectly understandable why somebody wouldn't want to live in an environment with a hoarder. However, the approach that we take to this is like an endless, vicious cycle where the very attitude we take towards their environment only serves to reinforce the conditions creating that behavior in the first place. When we say, I can't deal with your trash anymore, and that's why we go away from them or reject them, because they identify with trash, we're essentially saying, you are why I am going away from you. It not only reinforces their self-concept, it makes you something that goes away, and thus reinforces their belief that objects are better to form relationships with than people. The objects are one thing they can control. Now here's the thing, when I say control, most people have an adverse reaction to it, but for the sake of understanding this, I need you to get something. People need a sense of control. People need to feel like they can avoid pain and can gain pleasure. Otherwise, they're in a state of complete helpless powerlessness. This is a life of fear. What we need to be doing with hoarders and everyone really is not to stand outside their reality. It's to get completely into their reality, get into their subjective reality, and by adopting the way they see things, create changes or pliability within their reality from the inside. We need to realize that the way we treat the objects and their experience is a direct reflection of them. We need to resolve the deep wounding that is beneath this addictive strategy so that there is no longer a need for that strategy to be employed. We need to remember that hoarding is a symptom. We need to treat the cause, not the symptom. If a hoarder is able to develop safe and nourishing relationships, the day will come where they feel the improvement is to clean their space and organize their living space according to joy instead of fear and prevention of potential pain. And they will ask you to help on this day, and they will need help on this day. And it is potential that on this day, during the process of cleaning and organizing, you can assist them in an emotional and mental way as well. One of the most painful things for a hoarder to realize is that an object can't and doesn't love them back. This always reawakens this pain of this emptiness and this lack of emotional connection that they experienced in their lives. As difficult as it may be, healing for a hoarder is always on the other side of that awareness. 
You cannot clean a hoarder space with an attitude of disapproval, rejection, or disgust. If you feel that way towards a hoarder's living environment, you should not even be in their living environment. You should not be part of the cleanup process. The cleaning up of a hoarder's environment must be done with an attitude of appreciation for anything within that environment. The letting go of anything makes them feel extremely vulnerable because with the letting go of each thing, they are getting closer and closer and closer to this inevitable feeling that they're going to be in a position to be in serious pain in the future. What this means is that the meaning of what you're doing must be carefully considered. You can never clean up a hoarder's environment with an attitude of, the meaning is this is gross. The meaning is you need to change this about yourself because it's screwed up and is causing everyone pain. The meaning has to be something positive, something like this object which served you so well is now going to serve somebody else because its purpose is going to be fulfilled elsewhere. Here's another example. When you're going through and organizing somebody's household because they will need help when it comes to organizing their household, that organization process has to be done not with the meaning of we're making these objects lonely, but by putting them in this way, organizing them this way, we're honoring and showing them respect. The process of a hoarder learning how to behave differently in the process of acquisition is just that. It's a process. The process of a hoarder learning to organize their living environment and learning to let go of things that are physical in their environment is just that. It is a process. Both are processes that can be traumatizing and that will inevitably bring up unresolved wounds that need resolution before continuing with the process and altering the behavior. So it's going to be a step-by-step -step thing. When this healing process with a hoarder is experienced, maybe you'll let go of one object and that will bring up an entire unresolved wound that needs to be resolved before we're ready to let go of the next object. Some hoarders are not even aware consciously of this deep trauma that has existed in their childhood environment. Now, of the ones that are aware, hoarders have turned away from people, understandably so. Any of us would do the same thing in their experience. This means that a hoarder who is aware of the emotional aspect or the mental aspect of trauma that is underlying their behavior is unlikely to involve you in it, aren't they? So you're probably going to be extra confused about why they're doing what they're doing, even if they're not. We tend to look at a hoarder as if we could never be like them. We tend to look at them with an attitude of disgust. We tend to not know how it could get this bad, or we don't know how they could live like that. We project that they are lazy. This behavior has absolutely nothing to do with laziness. We project that they are the disorder when they are much, much more than that. They have simply developed a coping mechanism. But hopefully after watching this, you can feel a sense of compassion for a person who is coping with their life in this way. That compassion is a very necessary ingredient to the safety of relationships that they actually need in order to not have a reason for this coping mechanism. And so that you can invite them even deeper into your heart, Hoarders may just be here on earth to teach us all a lesson. And that lesson is, there is nothing in existence that does not have some kind of value, regardless of whether you see it or not. Have a good week.